You are listening to a sermon from River Community Church in Prairieville, Louisiana. Would you remain standing for the reading of God's Word from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. I thank Him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because He judged me faithful, appointing me to His service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. you may be seated. We saw last week in our study of 1 Timothy that, that Paul has deployed Timothy to Ephesus to address certain false teachers who've arisen in the church who have an unhealthy fascination with the more obscure parts of the Old Testament. Their fascination with these mythical elements and obscure figures from the genealogies was tied to a granular and, and speculative devotion to the law of Moses. And this resulted in a bunch of fruitless debates and useless discussions and their Bible studies together and their worship services together. In this, these, these false teachers were distracting themselves and entire congregations from the core message of the gospel, which is that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now, having addressed these, the matter of these false teachers and their approach to the law, Paul now picks up a deep expression of thanksgiving to God for his grace, specifically the grace that Jesus showed to Paul himself. But understand, this paragraph is not a digression from the subject at hand. Now, Paul is continuing to provide his exhortation and encouragement to Timothy about how to lead and guide the church. And the matter of the false teachers is still in the background. At one level... This Thanksgiving paragraph provides a defense of Paul's apostleship and of his authority. He highlights his conversion on the Damascus Road that then led into his call to ministry. Significantly, Jesus, I mean, Paul was converted directly by the Lord Jesus Christ. He was called to ministry directly by the Lord Jesus Christ. Likewise, at another level, this paragraph constitutes a continued rebuttal of the false teachers that had arisen in Ephesus. Paul emphasizes here the centrality of the gospel for the worship and work of the church. As William Mounts comments, Paul uses his personal testimony in verses 12 through 17 to argue that salvation is through mercy and grace and not through adherence to Jewish myths based on the law. Paul, as the ultimate example, stands in direct contrast to the false teachers. We'll study this testimony in Thanksgiving under the following headings. First, the core message of the gospel. Second, Paul as a model of the gospel. And then third, praise as the result of the gospel. 
The central thesis of Paul's message to Timothy is found in verse 15. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. This is the core message of the gospel. This is our first point, and this statement undergirds the whole letter. And it, it highlights and reinforces the idea that the problem going on with the false teachers is that they were being distracted from the core message of the gospel and that what they needed to do was to go deeper into the gospel. First, Paul introduces his summary of the gospel by writing, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full accept acceptance. It's like Jesus saying, truly, truly, I say to you, Paul is saying, pay close attention here. This is a matter of vital importance. Don't tolerate any divergence from this point. It's the most profitable thing for you and for your congregation to understand that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. It is Christ Jesus, the eternal Son of God, the Messiah, the Son of David, the Lord of heaven and earth. He came into this world. This world created by God is very good, but under the condemnation and curse of God because of our sin. This Jesus became man, and that in a low, humble condition, born into poverty, born under the law, born under all the effects of the curse and wrath of God in this life. And he died on the cross. He came into this world to do all this to save sinners like you and like me. Jesus did not come into the world to satisfy our idle curiosities. He did not come into the world to answer all of your questions about the Bible. He did not come into the world to do these things. He came into the world to save sinners sinners. Jesus did not come into the world to give us a new perspective on life, to make us marginally better people, or make us feel better about ourselves. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Jesus did not come for those who are already wise or discerning or intelligent. God chose what is foolish in the world. God chose what is weak in the world. God chose what is low and despised in the world to bring to nothing the things that are. God did not come for those who are already righteous, who already have their lives put together, who have a great resume or religious record. Those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners, Jesus said. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. In fact, Jesus came to save the very type of person that Paul has just described in verses 9 through 11. He came for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane. He came for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, and perjurers. The very people the law condemns are the people that Jesus came to save. The very people the law 
condemns are the people Jesus came to save. Which brings us to the meaning of salvation. There's this whole matrix of words that describe what happens when a sinner repents and believes in the Lord Jesus. We can talk about forgiveness, and we can talk about justification. We can talk about adoption. We can talk about lots of things. But when we are talking about salvation, we're talking the language of deliverance. To be saved is to be rescued from something. You must be saved from something. So what is the sinner saved from? Ultimately, we are saved from the wrath and curse of God, expressed primarily in the curse of death. Romans 5.9 says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. James 5.20 says, Whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death. The wrath of God against sin is demonstrated in the curse of death. For the wages of sin is death. To be delivered by the Lord Jesus Christ means to be delivered from the wrath of God, manifest in death, and be given instead the gift of eternal life. But this eternal life has consequences in the present. Eternal life is not just something future, In the New Testament, eternal life is something that is now. And it's expressed primarily in victory and deliverance over sin itself. As Gabriel promised Mary in Matthew 1.21, You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Likewise, Jesus told his disciples that whoever practices sin, whoever engages in a regular pattern of sinful behavior, is a slave of sin. And two verses later, he says, But if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Amen. Therefore, what Jesus saves us from is not merely our future death or the fearful judgment of the last day. He delivers us from sin itself, even in the present. Paul's not just talking about the forgiveness of our sins in heaven. He's talking about an actual transfer and transformation of you in the present world. That makes a difference in your life. Because when Jesus saves sinners, he actively transfers us from the domain of darkness under the power of the devil, and he transfers us into the kingdom of his glorious light. And there we are vivified by the power of the Holy Spirit And we become new creation in Christ so that Paul can say if anyone is in Christ, he is new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. Forgiveness, my friends, is only one step in the transfer, transformation process that is biblical salvation. It's not the end of the gospel. It's where the gospel begins. So as it's been said, Jesus comes to people where they are, but he does not leave them where they are. Jesus comes to people where they are, but he does not leave them where they are. And as a side application, that should be our ministry in the church too. 
We should receive people where they are, reach out to people where they are, without the condemnation of the law, but with the grace of Jesus, but we don't leave them where they are. We don't leave them trapped in their sin. We don't trap, leave them trapped in their old way of thinking or relating or doing life. We begin a path of discipleship to growth and transformation. Second, Paul is a model of the gospel at work. Hardly anybody on earth, past or present, can compete with the apostle Paul for being able to testify to what I just said, that Jesus comes to people where they are, but he does not leave them where they are. Prior to Christ stopping Paul on the Damascus Road, he was a zealous young Pharisee hell-bent on the destruction of what he believed was a Jewish cult. In his own words and self-evaluation in this paragraph, he calls himself a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent opponent, not just of the church, but of Jesus Christ himself. This indeed is what we find of Paul in the book of Acts. We meet Paul for the first time in Acts chapter 7, in verse 58 of Acts 7. And there we find him under his Jewish name, Saul. Sometimes you'll hear people say that Saul was his name before conversion and Paul was his name after. That's probably a mistaken notion, though a lot of people say it. Saul, or Shaul, was his Hebrew name. Paulos was his Greek name. So Paul's full name was something like Shaul Paulos of Tarsus. When we find him, he's in Jerusalem, ministering as the Hebrew of Hebrews. Obviously, he's selected his Hebrew name. When he's ministering among the Gentiles, he becomes a Greek to the Greeks. And he uses his Greek name. But that's an aside. Because when we first meet Paul in Acts 7, and I'm going to use those names interchangeably, we find Paul happily collecting the garments and coats of those who are about to stone the young Stephen, a man full of the Holy Spirit, one of the first deacons of the church, clearly gifted with prophecy. And as he is stoned, he sees into heaven itself. And then next, in the opening verses of chapter 8, we read of the growing persecution of, of Christians in Jerusalem with Saul at the helm. 8.1 says, And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church. And entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. And then at the beginning of chapter 9, we read this of the young Paul. Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if any, he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Kent Hughes describes Paul prior to this, his conversion this way. He was a callous, pious, self-righteous, bigoted murderer hell-bent on a full-scale inquisition. His hatred soon reached well beyond Jerusalem. He sought and retrieved extradition papers from the Sanhedrin so he could go to Damascus and ravage the Christian community there as well. It was 150 miles to Damascus, about a week's journey. But God was rich in mercy towards Paul. He did not condemn him with the condemnation that he deserved. He gave him something different. He gave him mercy and showed him grace. Twice in this passage, Paul says, but I received mercy. This is what made the difference in his life but I received mercy. There on the Damascus road, Jesus appeared to Paul and stopped him dead in his tracks. That appearance was an act of divine mercy, and it changed Paul forever. 
God stepped in and the person of Jesus Christ and did what Paul neither deserved nor was capable of doing himself. Thus, this message of gospel transformation is not some abstract article of confession for Paul. It was a reality that had changed his life. The doctrine of irresistible grace was core to Paul's experience. Because in Paul's life, the effect of Christ's coming to save sinners from their sin was evident for all to see. In fact, the very purpose of Paul's conversion was to be an evidence, a model of the deeply transformative power of the gospel. In verse 13, Paul writes, But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. When Paul was persecuting the church of Jesus Christ, he thought he knew what he was doing. He thought he was being faithful to the Bible. He thought he knew what it taught and what it required. He thought he knew his theology just about as well as anybody out there. He thought he was helping God. But it was all misguided zeal. And he was ignorant of the most important of facts. Of the risen lordship of Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. Paul was blind and he didn't have eyes to see. What is more, Paul was precisely the type of man for whom Jesus prayed on the cross. In Luke 23, 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Was Paul there in Jerusalem? Maybe. We don't know. Paul, before his conversion, didn't really know what he was doing, even though he thought he did. But God stepped in, the Lord Jesus stepped in, and stopped him in the tracks and, and blinded him with the light of of the gospel, of the glory of the blessed God. And thus, in the place of the trifecta of blasphemy, persecution, and violence, the Lord Jesus overflowed with grace towards Paul, filling him with faith and love. Note the difference. Paul went from being a blasphemer a persecutor, a violent, insolent opponent of Christ himself to being a man marked by grace and faith and love. That brings us to the second, but I receive mercy in verse 16. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience and as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. By the time Paul arrived in Damascus in Acts 9, he was a changed man. But the Christians there were terrified of him. It took a mighty work of the Spirit to convince even Ananias to go to Paul to heal him and disciple him. And at least part of what it means for Paul to call himself the foremost of sinners, the worst or chief of sinners, is that at least in the church of that time, he was the most visible of sinners. Think about it. If you were to ask the other apostles and other church leaders, who was the most vile, hateful, antagonistic enemy of the gospel in the entire world, they would have said, Sal Palos of Tarsus. Without a doubt. Top of the list. Enemy number one. But what did God do? God chose the most vile, hated enemy of the gospel to become the apostle to the lost nations of mankind. By the mercy of God, Paul then became an example 
a model and a living testimony to the power of God to save even the most vile of sinners. He is an example of the very decree that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. After all, he says, I am the worst of them. And if that's true, it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, or how hostile you are to the Christian faith. When you believe, if you believe, you receive eternal life and it changes you. Immediately, deeply, and forever. And for the rest of us, if God can make this sort of a difference in a hateful person like Paul, then he can do it in the life of any sinner you know. Any sinner you know. That brings us to the third point, praise as the result of the gospel. Our passage is something of a gospel sandwich, if you will. Right in the middle is Paul's wonderful summary. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But on either side of that confession is a testimonial of God's mercy to Paul. And bracketing the top and bottom is thanksgiving to the Lord Jesus Christ at the beginning and a glorious doxology of praise to the King of heaven and earth at the end. It's it's what we call a chiasm. Now, to fully appreciate Paul's movement from thanksgiving to praise through the gospel, I want to return to think a little bit more about what Paul says about himself in verse 15 when he says, I am the foremost or worst of sinners. Commentators like to point out that Paul speaks of himself in the present tense. He doesn't say, I was the worst of sinners. He says, I am the worst of sinners, the foremost. This posed a little problem for me in my exegesis, because he's clearly not saying that he's still a blasphemer or persecutor of the church, or insolent opponent. There's there's a difference in Paul now. He's not the man he once was. He's been delivered from that version of himself. That's what it means he was saved. Nor do I think that Paul struggled with a guilty conscience. This was the apostle of the doctrine of justification by faith alone. He's the apostle of the doctrine of adoption and of a clean conscience before God. I don't see how Paul could have been filled with shame and regret. He himself said that godly grief produces repentance that leaves us free from regret. That's 2 Corinthians 7.10. So how can Paul still consider himself to be the worst of sinners? It's because even though his conscience is clear and he knows he's been forgiven, he knows God loves him completely and he's not dwelling in the past, he still lives with the constant awareness of what he once was. He's forgiven, yes, but he can't forget it even if he wanted to. As Rosaria Butterfield has said, my past sin is only as far away as the back of my eyelids. My past sin is only as far away as the back of my eyelids. I just have to close my eyes and I can remember what I was and where I was. And what I did. For Paul, I think all he had to do was close his eyes and he could see Stephen's beaming face looking up into heaven as he was stoned to death with rocks and cheer 
And, and Paul was there cheering the crowd on, relishing in the sight of the blood of an innocent man. I don't think Paul ever forgot the sinful past that he had been delivered from. He was not the same person he once was, and yet he will still cry out in Romans chapter 7, O wretched man that I was, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Friends, until the return of Christ and the resurrection, Paul recognized that his old self, the old man, was still present. And because of that constant awareness of what he had been delivered from, Paul was abounding and overflowing with praise to the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father Almighty. And so Paul writes to Timothy in verse 17, to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. As John Calvin comments, this sublime praise of God's grace swallows up all the memory of his former life. How great and deep is the glory of God. And friends, this is what happens when you are truly gripped by the gospel. When you're gripped by the gospel, the first thing that happens is you are really meaningfully delivered from your sins. And if, and if you are still walking in sin and a destructive pattern of life, then at some level there's an area of your heart and your life that the gospel has not grabbed a hold of yet. Because when the Lord Jesus Christ really grabs a hold of you, you can't sin anymore. Not in the same way. Not, not in the same pattern of behavior. When the Lord Jesus comes in deep to you, he changes you. But not only does he do that, not only does he deliver you from the chains of your past, not only does he give you eternal life, he gives you the eyes to see just how wonderful and precious and sweet the gospel is. When you're converted, you think you know what the gospel is. You think you, you know what it means to be forgiven and saved and delivered. But as you grow and you mature and you see just how deep your roots of sin really go, just how wounded as a person you are and what, what God has delivered you from, the gospel becomes sweeter and sweeter day by day. You're filled with a deep appreciation for the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus. You see all of life as an undeserved blessing from his hand. You see and appreciate the depths of his mercies that extended to you when you were wallowing in your filth and your sin. You can see God's ongoing mercies, his continuing grace to you in your current sins, in your current weakness, in your current need. And because of the crystal clarity that you have on the gospel, true and fervent praise comes erupting from your lips. Praise the Lord. Worship, my friends, is a necessary fruit of the gospel in your life. If you have seen Jesus truly, you will love Jesus deeply. And you can't help but express that in praise and thanksgiving and confessing your faith and professing your faith in church and in the world and even in loud singing. There is a God who reigns in the heaven who is exalted forever. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, and he reigns supreme. He is the king of ages. Praise the Lord. He is eternal and undying and unchanging, and in him there is no variation or shadow due to change or decay. Praise the Lord. He is invisible and unseeable, and he dwells in unapproachable light. He is the only God, and there is no other. Praise the Lord. 
And praise the Lord because Jesus Christ has revealed this only God to us in the flesh. In Christ, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, the undying God, the immortal God, died on the cross. In Christ Jesus, the invisible God became visible. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In Christ Jesus, the one and only God has revealed the great mystery that he is triune. One God, one in essence, in glory and in power, but three in person. And so to this God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may there be forever from our lips honor, that is, reverence, and glory, that is, Weightiness, gravity, forever and ever. Amen. So as we close, let me encourage you, my friends, probe your hearts today. Do you see the gospel clearly? Do you see Jesus clearly? Or has that been obscured by many years and sins? Do you see the gospel clearly? Do you see Jesus clearly? Or has it been obscured by many years of self-righteousness? Do you see the gospel clearly? Do you see Jesus clearly? Or have you become numb to the things of God? Because they've become familiar and ordinary. Have you lost your sense of wonder? Have you lost your sense of awe? Friends, there's nothing ordinary about the gospel. It is a wonderful, glorious thing that makes all the difference in the world. And may we here at River, may we forever glory in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And may we marvel in this fact that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. May we retain this awareness in ourselves that each of us, in our own way, in our own minds, we view ourselves as the worst of sinners. By that I mean, may our own sins loom larger in our mind than the sins of others. May our own need and desperation of Jesus loom larger in our minds than the way somebody else needs Jesus. And may we be so filled with wonder and awe at Christ's mercy to me that praise is always overflowing from my lips. And the message of Christ's coming to save sinners is always overflowing from me to the people around me, whether they know it or don't know it. And a church that is shaped by this message of the gospel that's really gripped is a transformed church. A life-giving church is a worshiping, evangelizing, praising, joyful, thankful, and humble church. May we be such a place. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to this sermon from River Community Church in Prairieville, Louisiana, where you will always find biblical preaching, meaningful worship, and the equipping of disciples. For more information on River Community Church and its ministries, please visit rivercommunity.org.